you are listening to the Let Me Overthink About It podcast, where I dive into a series of topics that occupy my anxious mind. I'm Sam Adore, overthinker extraordinaire. This week, I'm overthinking about ending the stigma with Fiona Kirkpatrick Parsons. Fiona is a senior national advisor with Deloitte Indigenous. She chaired the 2023 North American Indigenous Games, which is where I got to see her in action firsthand. She's really an all around awesome human, does so much volunteer work, is a mom, a wife, and an advocate, and she's just incredible. I hope you enjoy our chat as much as I did. Here goes. I am here with Fiona Kirkpatrick Parsons. Hello, Fiona. Hello, Sam. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, it's great to be here. I feel like as I was, you know, getting prepared for this conversation, well, as much as I actually prepare, let's be real. Um, <laughs> I was like, we have so many things we could overthink about. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> well, that's welcome to my brain. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I've been accused and of I, overthinking once in a while. Yeah. Well, and I was going to actually start with that question, Fiona, because, yeah. uh, you know, some people I talk to don't actually consider themselves to be an overthinker. So what would you say about that? I think as time goes on, I'll be 62 in a couple of months. Um, Holy moly. Are you kidding? Uh, no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'll be 62 and I was born 62? in 1962. So the 62 is oh, a big number awesome. for me. I've got I've got some uh, things around 62 this year. Um, I love it. I, I think, thank you. I, I think as I get older, I find myself not overthinking as much. So if there's any comfort, I think with age often comes that, I don't know, let's just make a decision. Like, let's just get this done. Like, don't be churning it over and over and over because it's a waste of energy and I don't have time. <laughs> so well, I, I like to make it decisions fairly quickly. I mean, I can be a little bit, um, I wouldn't say too quick, probably when I was younger. Like I, had th I think I found the balance for me that works. But I, awesome. I, can, I can overthink until I'm just exhausted of thinking of that thing. But I feel satisfied that I have done all the thinking. Does that make sense? Okay, so it can actually, in some cases, work for you in terms of making sure you've checked all the boxes kind of thing yeah that I've processed it properly whatever the it is and yeah. yeah yeah so I relate to overthinkers very much but I don't think I'm as much as I used to be yeah and I I love to hear that for myself I'm I just turned 43 where uh we're recording this beginning you don't like it turned, well thank <laughs> you for that um and I found with a couple of things overthinking a little bit but also I find comparison has gotten less and less the older that I get comparing mm -hmm. myself against other people I'm certainly not quote unquote cured of that but I do find with age that that is getting better yeah. um good and also just being more comfortable just being myself well you know the adage right that that uh, comparison is the thief of joy that is yes. an absolute truth yes and I do have to catch myself once in a while but you're right, right. as as I get older that's another thing that I I just look at it like I'm running my own race here you know I'm not competing against anybody I am um if if I'm competing that's the right word it's just with myself I love and, that. and that's it um, I'm running my own race I love that quote I'm a quotaholic, so I'm going to take <laughs> that one and run with it. Pardon me. Okay. Feel free. Feel free. <laughs> yeah, right. Public domain. And I'm sure I didn't make that up. Somebody else probably said it and I stole it, but that's okay. We'll just, we'll just give you credit. We don't know the difference. I don't know who to attribute it to, but I just <laughs> came up with that one. <laughs> I love it. And on the note of co competition, because I have to be honest with you, I fangirled over you a little bit this summer, Fiona, because oh. you were chairing the North American Indigenous Games here in Nova Scotia, and yeah. you did just such a fantastic you and the committee of folks did such a fantastic oh, yeah. job of that event. You know, it took everyone, including you as a volunteer, um, it took everyone to make these games happen the way they did. And I could not have been more thrilled with not only the board of directors. I mean, I was on the board, uh, still technically am the chair of the board because we're still, you oh. know, we're kind of sweeping up the building after everyone's left. There's Fair. lots to do from a board perspective to wind up the affairs of the whole society. But yeah, our volunteers, our staff, our, our board um, members, which who are volunteers, 
were stellar. I was really just fortunate enough to be the person that was, you know, uh, at the helm of that. But I, I don't really feel like I was at the helm. I feel like I was at the, you know, the stern, if you will, like a behind yeah. and just sort of watching it all unfold. And I was there if they needed me and make sure that we paid the bills and that sort of thing. You know, that was yeah. kind of the job of the chair is to make sure that we have the good governance in place. And I, I don't know that governance was ever my strength. I think it was more just the passion for youth and yes. specifically Indigenous youth and just yeah. the excitement of being able and I'm very passionate about where I live now I've been here in Chibuktuk in Halifax for 24 years and I love it here and I just really wanted us to shine and we did you know we did my gosh and I of course I live in Truro so Millbrook is Millbrook was amazing and it was so cool having it here in Millbrook and to see the pride and to see that venue being used at the beautiful powwow space Right. Um, it 3D was just, archery was what a great sport. Like I didn't learned see so a lot much about it. 3D archery that, that week right? that I never knew before, but it was super, super cool. Yeah, I heard about the bear. We'll, we'll talk about that later. No. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty cool, actually, if you think about it. It was. But so, and I think too, from a um pride of place perspective, that if you if you relate that to mental health and mental wellness how great mm-hmm. is that really to have that ability to celebrate within you know your adopted hometown but yeah um, within Nova Scotia such a national worldly event I think it was really good for not just um and it was really primarily the Mi'kmaq people mm-hmm. the hosts like I'm not Mi'kmaq I'm Cree I'm from mm-hmm. northern Saskatchewan from Lac La Ronge First Nation Treaty 6 territory I just happened to fall in love with a maritimer and I moved out here and got married in 1999. Um, but awesome. I've absolutely felt completely embraced by and have so much respect and love for Mi'kmaq people. And I was really honored that um, yeah. that I was able to chair an event that was held on their territory. And they, you know, I know from speaking to so many people who were involved with the games who are Mi'kmaq, they took so much pride in being able to showcase their cultures yeah. And, and and culture, but also cultures, because there are different communities of different ways, you know, of being and expressing themselves. Um, but just, you know, the the, the broader community of Truro, of, of, of Halifax, of Chibuktuk, yeah. and really, truly all of Nova Scotia, I think, took a little, quite a lot of pride in saying, you know, we hosted the largest multi-sport and cultural event in Atlanta, Canada's history since contact. And we did it beautifully. The last day, notwithstanding, given the weather, but that was beyond our control. That's we right. had, you know, epic, epic rain <laughs> the last day, oh, yeah. which was uh, unfortunate. But, you know, we all say like creator never makes mistakes. So there's got to be a reason. There was a protection or something in that. And we uh, we just we did what we could. And and all that mattered to me was that everyone was safe. Uh, yeah. All the all the youth had the time of their lives. You know, we know that they did. Everyone went home with their own personal story um yeah. and positive story and the welcome that they received was absolutely unlike any other i mean we we asked for 3000 volunteers we had uh, over 3000 actually signed up like fully you know trained and all the rest but we yeah. had over 5000 people apply that oh my was god blew my mind i did that just realize. tells you like how i think this region has changed yeah for the better because of these games and that's yeah. one of the legacies of the games. I feel like it, it's shifted minds and hearts and uh, created a, a renewed sense of pride in of place, as you said. Yeah, 100%. And I feel like without knowing you, I mean, I follow you on LinkedIn, Fiona, but without knowing you personally, I feel like community is such a strong part of of everything that you do. I mean, we talked briefly before going live in the recording uh, mm-hmm. about your volunteer work outside of NEG as well. And that to me all relates back to community and how community is so important to you. Do you want to maybe speak to that a little? Yeah, I think really comes down to if you can do something to contribute, you should. Oh, yeah. Like we all yeah. have skills. Uh, we all have talents. We all have gifts. And it is our job in life and it is a teaching that that i was was, that was shared with me when i was really small we're all given gifts 
and it is our job to share them, to find them and to share them. So I just go where I feel I've, I can be of use, whatever it is I have, whether it be a lot or a little, um, I, I try to contribute. I don't, I'm, I'm, I don't go around saying I'm the best at anything. I'm usually not the best at everything or anything in particular. I just have a passion to um, get involved. And I don't know, I'm not sure where that started, but I've, you know, when I lived in Calgary, it was the same. I did volunteer quite a bit. But living here, there is such a strong sense of community to begin with. Mm-hmm. And I just want to, I found my little niches for it. So for all the volunteering that I've done over the last 24 years since I've been here, um, I'm never not volunteering for something. I was looking back recently because I've been really reflecting. I've been in that mode and I've never not volunteered. And it's been, it gives me almost more than I give those opportunities because I get so much from it. You learn so much. You make a lot of friends. You um, and you're contributing to the greater good, you know, whether it be something like a recreational activity, whether it be the mental health of people living in this province, whether it's, uh, you know, a a cancer fundraiser. My husband's living with a form, a rare uh, form of bone marrow cancer, and we got very involved. Actually, the year before he was diagnosed, we got involved with the Ride for Cancer, uh, supporting the QE2 Foundation. And in the early days, it also supported Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. But you know, all these things, I think we should all do something that resonates with us. There's always something yes. that will resonate. And just most people just don't know how to get going or if they, if they're enough. Mm-hmm. And I want wow. to say to every single yeah. person, you are e- absolutely enough. And I'm starting to sound like an embroidered pillow or something. But <laughs> <laughs> you are enough. I Live, love, love laugh. If you could say that to me every day, I'll Live, listen love. to that every day. <laughs> we all need to hear it. Yeah. We oh, all need 100%. to hear it and tell ourselves that we do because we all will have those shaky moments. I have them all the time. <laughs> um, but I think we just have to step up. That's what makes life rich is giving. It, well, it's it, funny. It, right? It, 100, I agree with you 100%. And it's funny that you're saying that about volunteering because I actually reached burnout a few years ago from volunteering. So like, over committing so saying yes yeah I might have been close this last year right so over committing to joking. that but yeah. then what I did was the polar opposite which was I'm saying no to everything I'm not getting involved with anything and it actually wasn't until this past year when I signed up to volunteer for NEG and then I signed up to also volunteer for the Parsboro Film Festival that I reminded myself how much I really do love that type of involvement yeah. in community so bring it you on had to, you had to the pendulum had to swing the opposite yes. direction for you to to come to that realization and it is good to take a break I'm not really sure when my break will come um yeah. exactly because people have come up to me and say oh then now that the games are over you must be just just resting I'm like mm, no but <laughs> I'm yet. able to give more to the other things that I was kind of perhaps neglecting a little bit in favor of what was the biggest priority of yeah. uh, my life in terms of outside my family of course and my day job um but the biggest priority for me personally was to make sure that I did my part to help to ensure the success of the games so yeah oh yeah. man well good job job well thank done <laughs> and to you too thank oh, you thank to you, you and to all of all peers and to the staff that we had everybody to a person who was so yeah. committed and so incredible and uh, we couldn't have we just couldn't have done it any better in my mind and that was the feedback yeah. we received so I'm really proud of all of us So great. And you also, so I didn't actually know this before um, I reached out to you that you are on the selection committee for the Mental Health Foundation of Nova Scotia for the grant um, applications. Yeah, community grants. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm so grateful that this season, this is my fourth season of my podcast and that uh, I reached out to Mental Health Foundation and got approved for a grant, which was fantastic. So glad. It's so it's initiatives like this that really do make a difference to people. And that's what the Community Grants Committee is all about. And we're a very diverse group. You know, we review each of us reviews and there are hundreds sometimes we review each of them. and they're they're scored very fairly, you know, at, at, but each one of those applications comes with a story, right? They come with a story about a need yeah. and a solution. 
and those solutions are so innovative, like a podcast like this. Yeah. And we, we are always looking for, it doesn't matter what it is, as long as it reaches someone and helps make a difference in their lives, because yeah. we all need a lift, you know, once in a while, I don't care who you are. We all need a little bit of support. And I love yeah. to see these sort of what we refer to as more grassroots initiatives. Yes. There's the big, you know, big moves, if you will, and the smaller ones, and they all contribute to creating um, an environment where we can talk about mental health and mental illness, where we can empathize and show compassion for each other and help each other. Yes. You know, because I think it's the most of the biggest challenge and from what I have seen, and I'm not a mental health professional, let me get that really clear, obviously, mm -hmm. but it's about, it's about making it safe for everyone to, to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. Yeah. It, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like be really comfortable with the uncomfortable conversations and just like reduce the stigma. There should be zero stigma. Yeah. Like, not just less stigma, no stigma around any form of illness, whether it be in your brain or in your body. And they are not separate. I, I had this conversation yesterday with a, a colleague who reached out to me for some reason. I hardly know her. And we were talking about this. She opened up and I, and I said, you know, there's, because she kept saying she had physical ailments and she had some mental health challenges. And I said, there is no difference. No. It is all connected. Exactly. And for whatever reason, yeah. when you talk about that stigma, and I've said it many times on my podcast, it's like, the stigma only is associated with the the stuff in your brain, the, the mental health side of it. And it's, yeah. it's all part of your overall health, period. It, it 100% is. They are very closely tied together. And uh, as from what I've seen, and, you know, we did talk about, um, uh, you know, we, we've had, I've had mental health challenges in my own family on um, a lot of my mother's side, so in, in many Indigenous uh, in First Nations communities, Inuit and Métis communities, you know, we do have a lot of, of challenges. We have a lot of success stories, too, which is also yes. really wonderful. But we yeah. do have challenges. And that was a priority for us, by the way, during NAG, was the mental wellness, the well-being of the participants. It was I a huge that. priority. And we brought in, you know, we had an elders program specifically to help the participants we had smudging stations where people who do partake in that practice could also do it and for anybody who wanted to experience yeah. that as well and um we had you know um say brave spaces where youth could go and connect with each other and just we really made sure that they knew that their mental well-being and their physical well-being all of it being very holistically um looked after Yes. And that, uh, that was a huge priority. And that, and that was a was first, evident. that was a first too. Like, well, we... and I, I'm not surprised to hear that it's a first, but it was very evident. And I think when you think about sporting events, you think, oh, you have to have the physiotherapist there, or you have to have the doctor handy or whatever. And you think, well, again, you know, when you consider it, your whole being mental, yeah. physical wellness, um, having somebody there or, or opportunities there to work on your mental health is so much. Well, yeah, and Don't you can't perform at your best. You can't no. perform at your best in sport. You can't perform at your best at work or in life without the support that you need. So, and even knowing what that you a do, lot, <laughs> right? Exactly, and even knowing that a lot of those, a lot of those folks, they're all youth, of course, but a lot of them, it's their first time away from home. That alone can cause a lot of mental mental um, anxiety. So we're still on a plane and a, some of them are a long way from home, but we had yeah. some youth from New Brunswick who were homesick, you know, like yeah. it doesn't really matter. It's just not being in your a familiar place. So we went out of our way to, you know, I really always said, and in every interview I did before the games, I wanted people to help these youths feel like they were at home, another home for a week Yeah, that they were, you know, that they were looked after and that, you know, that they, they just felt entirely welcome here. That's amazing. Um, that went a long way, I think, to helping a lot of those those young people feel like, all right, now Halifax is a pretty all right place to be. Yes. Millbrook, and Millbrook is an all 
and some yeah. Megan Agony as well. They host That's right. Yeah. Uh, softball. So, softball. Yeah. yeah. So why is it important for you? And I, I know you mentioned that there's some history in your family on your mother's side. Why was it important for you to get involved with the Mental Health Foundation? Well, I was asked, I think, you know, initially they were, they did want someone who was Indigenous and to, to bring that perspective for diversity's sake, not tokenism, but recognizing that, you know, there's um, very much an underserved community and that I do have experience um, with it in my family. I have a, a lot of, uh, unfortunately, a lot of suicide in my family um, and, and other like addiction issues, as well as you know, I have relatives who are working in the mental health space as well. My cousin Val is the director of a of a, a wellness um, facility in northern Saskatchewan. Oh wow! So yeah, so and I do think she, you know, like me, is really driven to again bring our whatever talents we have uh, to contribute. And yeah. for me, it's I have a background in marketing and communications um i realize i have a platform and a and of some sort and an, a bit of an audience so you know i'm going to i'm going to use that to good advantage right so what got me interested is i was asked um uh, it was put before me and I, I saw the rest of the team that was involved the committee members and i thought this is a really astute and experienced group and i kind of wonder what i was doing there because they're all like pretty much in the mental health fields but uh, I have learned a lot um, from being with them. And I, I just, you know, I have a, a pretty good idea uh, just based on my own life experience, living in four provinces and one territory in this country. Mm -hmm. I also lived in Scotland for six years. Um, but Ooh. I, but in, re in relation to the communities I lived in, there was, a, you know, a remote community in Northern Manitoba, a fly-in community. I spent three and a half years. I lived in the Arctic, you know, and I've seen the same issues over and over and they're you know there are specific needs right so bringing that perspective to the table I think has been I've been told that's been helpful so yeah that's how I got involved that was a long-winded answer to that simple question <laughs> well no it was a great answer because you're seeing those uh those trends right across the various places that you've been and so to be able to bring that perspective they've been going on a very oh, long time yeah because I'm talking back in the late 60s, you know, we came back, I was born in Canada, I was born on the res in uh, Lac La Ronge, but we moved to Scotland when I was a baby and came back okay. when I was six and lived in mostly Manitoba at that time. And I've been all over, you know, so from the late 60s until now, uh, many of the problems are the same. Now we are seeing much more economic development, much more hope coming to the communities, much more self-sufficiency, sovereignty, um, all of the things that really help build, you know, one's own self-confidence, um, you know, in a, in a sustainable way, right? Like you, yeah. you can, you get, you attract, you start to attract more opportunities while creating your own education systems as we're seeing in some communities, not being reliant on the federal government for like the kind of education I received in two day schools in Manitoba. Uh, well, I literally have a, a, a report card I found not too long ago that says Department of Indian Affairs at the top of the report card. It's kind of bizarre. Wow. You think that about it now. Bizarre. But yeah, yeah. They're, they're setting up their own, you know, hospital systems, medical care systems and things like that. So we are seeing change and, and it's great. So we just have to keep that ball rolling. And, uh, right. you know, I'm really enjoying seeing all the various programs and initiatives such as yours that are popping up all over Nova Scotia. It's just community members stepping up. And it just, honestly, it makes me weep sometimes to see the effort that people are putting into helping other yeah. people here. It's amazing to me. 100%. And I think for me too, with this, with this initial, the podcast, the, the basis for this podcast was to have just like organic conversations where mental health themes come up and are discussed because it doesn't have to be you know on a big stage and it doesn't have no. to be something that is a special event it can just be a conversation because it's part of our everyday so we need to have these conversations as if it's yeah. part of our everyday if that makes sense Ab absolutely absolutely um i think that helps people a lot you know i was uh, before coming on here you I, you had asked me previously if a, if we could talk about you know the challenges in my own household 
And um, so I did stick with my daughter and she is absolutely 100% fine with it. I want to say that publicly because she herself is very open and will be in the mental health professions uh, of one kind or other when she finishes her education. That's the direction she's going with a minor in Indigenous studies, go figure. But she's a a psychology major and she will be... um, hopefully going to get her honors and move on to a master's. So that's the direction she's really keen on. And she does want to do mental health work in uh, Indigenous communities. So that's, uh, I'm so proud of her. And for her to have arrived at this point, you know, it's been a long journey. But um, how she has shown to me, it's shows so much strength when, when someone has to and I wish she didn't have to push through, but the fact that she did says so much about her character. Yeah. When I look back and see how much she was truly struggle, struggling, I don't know that we actually really knew how much she was truly struggling at the time. We just knew day to day. Like I, you know, there were mornings I would wake up, I'd go to her room and wonder if she was going to still be breathing. Like she was, that's, you know, and that I think was for me, it was about a year and a half of that feeling of my daughter has suicidal ideation, right? right? Which is one of the scariest things. Yeah. And of course we did have her see therapists and we just never quite hit the right mark. And she got so tired of telling her story over and over. And that in itself is just an affront to your mental health. To have to be re-traumatizing yourself over and over. But what else could we do? We just showed her complete, you know, under, uh, understanding and love as we tried not to blame ourselves for being terrible parents. And how could we have, you know, how could our daughter be in such rough shape? And, um, but she really, you know, she, she has done an amazing job has probably been on every single medication there is for depression, anxiety, and now ADHD. Um, and it has been sort of, we have, we are gifted with a fantastic family doctor who I know not everybody gets to have one. Yes. And we've had one for many years and just I pray she never, ever retires. <laughs> um, we are very fortunate. I know that that is a huge privilege in this province. And that is another yes. problem that we, ha- we do yes. have here. Because when you have somebody who knows you really well as a physician, they can go along with you on the journey. And she has a skill in, um, in sort of the, she's not a psychiatrist, but she does have a lot of experience with, with mental illness. And so she was really able to help fine tune things. So I think we're at a point now, looks like where uh, my daughter's feeling so much more clarity, much more herself. And, uh, you know, and, and at school, is it's starting to reflect that. But of course, she started her first year university, September of 2020. Oh, my which gosh. Was entirely it was in her bedroom, right? So that wasn't exactly helpful. Not very conducive to um, superb mental health. So, yeah. yeah, she was coming from behind from the beginning. But I'm super proud of how far she's come. And, you know, she had three A's the last semester. And Amazing. so, yeah, you know, we're not under any illusions. You know, it's not a straight line from, you know, the bottom to the to the peak of mental wellness, but uh, it's really encouraging to see that the hope coming back and the yeah. self belief coming from her that she knows she can she can do this and she's feeling more positive and um yeah and just, I, I've learned a lot from her amazing and just how important like you said it is to have that support system of folks who will help you push through give you the space you need but also give you that push that you need because it is hard it is hard to continue to go and tell your story I know from personal experience trying to find the right therapist and trying to find the right medication and going in and out of different side effects and withdrawal and all of that stuff is hard on a good day Right. When you're already struggling with your mental health. Yeah, because it takes like weeks for like the medications to start working. And then and then you start transitioning from one to another. One doesn't work. And it's just like a mess. The fact that you can even get out of bed in the morning while you're going through all of that is just I think that shows so much strength. Oh my god. Not weakness. 
Yes. It shows so much strength. And that's what I choose to see. A lot of mental illness is that is looking at what you perceive as weaknesses as actually your strengths, because you do have the Absolutely. capacity to get through. Absolutely. Well, my daughter, of course, being a fourth year psych student also is starting to diagnose me, right? Um, <laughs> diagnose your family members. And she has a pretty strong idea of where her ADHD came from. Hint, hint, not her father. <laughs> and so Fair it's enough. been an interesting journey. She says she figures I'm on, definitely on that spectrum. And I am not surprised. She did the she did the questionnaire um, that the family, our family doctor gave her, sent her to like this apps this particular website that's for psychiatrists and psychologists. And okay. she did this, she printed this thing out, she brought it back, to, you know, completed it, brought it back to the next appointment. But when my daughter figured out that I probably have, am on the, on that spectrum, I was looking at her, she shared it with me and I was looking at her answers and I said, well, these don't seem like unusual at all. Like they seem like normal. She goes, okay. Okay, mom. Um, can I just tell you that, <laughs> you if you think this is normal you are definitely <laughs> on you're with me like you were on the same plane as I am with respect right. to that so things are starting to make a lot of sense to me now um and that's sure. the case for a lot of folks too who just I mean ADHD wasn't a thing that you were talking about or knowing about or no. you know certainly not able to diagnose in yourself so there are a lot of folks who have yeah. undiagnosed um, yeah I haven't had a formal like professional diagnosis yet so let me just yeah. say that but and I and I know that yeah. it's trendy right now <laughs> ADHD right. is trending right but, yeah <laughs> but I think it's just out and especially with women you know yeah. and girls we're finding out more about you know, how that shows up. And uh, so it's been a really, I could, I consider it, if that is in fact the case with me, I consider it my superpower uh, that I've actually, because it does allow me to do a lot of things at once. It's- Well, if this goes back look to at me our, and, our volunteer right? conversation. <laughs> people look at me and go, what are you doing? Like, why are you doing so, like, how can you do it all? I'm like, I don't know. Yes, yeah. I can. And I like it. But there is a point at which I do have to be careful not to burn out and I yeah. ain't getting any younger. So I probably should slow down a little. We'll see. Stay right. tuned. Watch this yeah. space. Well, I may or may not. I was going to say, I'll be in touch around this time next year. See how you do it. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, I'm on a couple of boards and I do chair committee and I'm on, well, several committees and then I've done on the mental health foundation things. So yeah, there's a lot going on, but uh, yeah, yeah. We'll see. It's a short life that we have. I it do really think we have to make, is. we do have to make the most of it. And I just love life. Um, you know, I, even despite all the challenges, like my dad passed away, you know, this year, yes. this past year in August, Sorry so it was just four that. months ago. Yeah. That's okay. I mean, um, it wasn't expected, but his birthday would have was December 31st. So we've just come past the first, you know, birthday that he would have had, uh, yeah. Had he been alive? And and it, that was definitely a challenge. Like that one when my dad passed threw me for a loop. And and so yeah. it happened the week after the games. So I went from a high, high, oh high to like one of the worst weeks of my life. But it was a <sighs> test. You know, it was a yeah. test of my own ability to move through, not around, not avoid, but move through uh grief which which I do still have I still grief I don't think ever really leaves you no so I don't not. expect it to not hurt but um but I it am just very yeah it shifts and I feel like grateful grateful to have the ability to do that yeah so I, I remain yeah yeah um and again it's a it's a good journey of self-awareness when you understand and are willing to just stand inside the knowledge of hey i'm not really okay right now mm. that's okay yeah you know putting on a brave face that's bs yes. anybody who knows me knows that i i wear my heart on my sleeve i cry at the drop of a hat i always have it's even worse now as I get older, <laughs> I no, I just let it all out. And I actually think that's healthy, to be honest. 
Agreed. Cause you're not bottling. Cause if you know the reverse yeah. of that and not what you're, what not crying or expressing yourself does to you, it's just, and so I do it toxic. at work too. Oh, it throws people off at work too. And I, but I warn people I'm a crier. It's okay. I'll be fine. I'm not losing it. Yeah. I am. Yeah. I just, I believe I just get it out. Um, I don't want to make other people feel uncomfortable. So I always like, yeah. like them know, but I never, I've learned, I don't say I never apologize for my tears. I used to, but I don't apologize for them now because the elder told me your tears are a blessing. Your tears are a blessing. So I think I'm really blessed. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I say. I'm so, really blessed. I so it, tears that. are a blessing. They're healing. And yeah. we all are carrying trauma. And I think yes. we all need to, cry a little more it's okay you're not losing your mind you're not out of control crying is healing so cry your little hearts out people it's okay I love that and I also loved um I saw you tweeted when your dad passed or just recently actually um that you don't think you're ever going to delete his contact information from your phone yeah, and that that really resonated with me after having lost my mom almost four years ago now, which is just inconceivable. But um, wow. her her contact information is still in my phone almost four years later. In in the past, I would have felt a little weird about that, but now I'm comfortable in that, mm-hmm. knowing that other people do it too helps as well. I couldn't believe that. I'm I I kind of took a Twitter vacation, I guess a pause for a couple of months uh, from September through October and into November, I think, uh, which I rarely do. So I'm fairly active on social media, but I, you know, I'm kind of fickle. I'll be really, you know, I'll go hard on Facebook for a while. Then I'll go hard on LinkedIn for a while. I just can't do it all. I have a life, you know, but <laughs> I was on Twitter. I decided to go back and it was an innocent little tweet. Yeah. And I really, I, I don't know. I don't usually do a lot of personal things there, but I did that that tweet went like mad. There was like, I I don't know how many 25,000 retweets or comments or like it was. Oh my goodness. And you just think how people are just so like, we need to talk about this stuff, right? It's like, exactly. It was just like the most beautiful, by the way, no negativity, Uh, the comments, you know how Twitter can be. Oh yeah. Comments can be just so vicious. And that's part of the reason I took a little step back because after dad died, I just, I couldn't bear all that negativity. I needed to yeah. build a little happy bubble around myself and that Twitter was not the place to do it. So no. when I tweeted that, the comments are beautiful. Like it became this, for me, um, I felt so embraced, like I felt this embrace of people were telling their stories and also supporting me. And I just, it was lovely. It was just, thank you. You know, what a nice uh, yeah. exchange everybody had. And I'm really glad I, I wasn't the only one who felt weird about it. Like, I was like, should I delete? There's no, there's no harm in keeping it and it does make me feel you know good for now just to know that it's there yeah. I don't know it's just it's, just it's a little sort of a mental game but it is comforting yeah so I'm yeah. gonna leave it for now we'll see what happens <laughs> stay That's tuned right. yes trust the process right the, the grieving process yeah and it's it, it is yeah. you hear it all the time it is different for everyone it's the first time I've lost a parent so um You know, I've lost other people in my life, obviously, you don't get to this age without having lost a few folks along the way, unfortunately, but yeah, it's it's, the first time I've lost somebody that close to me and my family. And um, so, yeah, I'm going, and I was with him. So it was uh, unique in that sense, because not everybody gets that, I think, opportunity to be in that profound and and sacred space. So that was a gift too. I consider that a gift. Yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Listen, you. I always ask my guests how, because I told you I'm a quotaholic, if you have any quotes that you go to, so if, or maybe you're not a quote person at all, but if there's a quote that stands out for you, Fiona, when you're like, maybe you just need a little push or a little inspiration, what that might be. My mother-in-law is, she knows me so well. She gives me a calendars, you know, that have. Oh yes. A quote a day kind of deal. Quote. Yeah. So yesterday's was something good is going to happen and today's is bright days ahead and the weekend is no one expected me everyone everything awaited me that was by patty smith i love to read the insights of other people and you know if they resonate with me then i'll just i'll sometimes i'll just hang on to them 
for when I need them. I think, I don't know if there's a quote specifically, but there are teachings in um, my culture, my Cree culture. My dad was Scottish, by the way. So I'm sure there's teachings there too. But in yes. the Cree culture, there are a lot of, of concepts and sayings. Um, one for me that I find myself repeating to others quite frequently is that, you know, you, you, do, you hear the adage of, oh, everything happens for a reason. I'm not sure I buy that. But I, I do, <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't, I think a lot of stuff is random. That's just me. But I do believe that we are where we need to be at every, any given time. Things are as they need to be at that time. And that can be difficult when things seem unfair and, and so on. But I, I've hung on to that and I have trusted that. And that has actually been one of those those threads that has pulled me through the last few months, both from a positive perspective when good things, have, and there have been so many good things have happened. I like, I look back at the last year of my life, including the, you know, unfortunately my dad passing. And I still think how freaking lucky, blessed, privileged I am to have the life that I have to have life at all. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I don't take any of it for granted. And, and so I'm, I'm glad of where I am. I'm happy for, you know, good health and for my daughter feeling better. Um, I have a happy home. I have lots of support and love around me. And um, I'm really glad I've got to this point in my life because it wasn't always like that. Like I, I have gone through lots of stuff as we all have. Yes. And so I'm grateful for everything, but that, that adage of has just popped into my mind is, you know, we are where we need to be. Things are as they need to be right now. So it's all right. Basically. I love that. I love there's that. One it's, more. Like, it's Oh, yeah. oh there's one more. It just, it just came <laughs> to my mind because there were four elders that I've had the great privilege of speaking with over the last month and a half, yes. three Mi'kmaq elders and one Cree elder. And they all said the same thing to me which was so interesting and they were about separate um incidents or, or thought ideas but they all said the same thing and that was be very very careful with your thoughts everything be very careful about what spirit you are bringing in whatever your thoughts are those are the words you speak the words you speak create an energy that will bring it to you, right? Mm -hmm. So whether it's things that are, you know, really watch your language. Like, are you speaking? Is everything Debbie Downer? Are you talking right. negatively about everything? Yeah. Or thinking negatively about everything or both? What you speak will be what you do and what you attract. And this is very common to so many philosophies 100%. around the world, right? Yeah. But this was something these... Four elders said almost exactly the same thing to me. So I believe I had to hear that at the right, at that time for me. And I have been able to share that with many other people lately. So I'll share it with you. That is be very mindful of your thoughts for those are your words. And those words become those actions. So what are those things that you want? What are your intentions? So maybe that we're speaking at the beginning of the year and people are starting to think about, well, you know, what am, how am I going to make this a great year? Yeah. Um, it's an opportune time to consider, you know, what are, what are my intentions? Focusing on what it is you want versus what you do not want. You speak the words of what you do not want. You will bring those things to you or you'll bring those things to someone close to you. Right. That has been um, something I was told when I was a small child. Yeah. You're going to, you know, if you do that, someone close to you is going to, you know, have that happen to them. Like that's yeah. usually something if I was being an idiot, like I was a bit of a, <laughs> you know, doing something like kids do. <laughs> right. You, you keep doing that. But there is some truth to that. <laughs> yes. You know, don't do that to your face. You're just going to freeze that way. You know. <laughs> yes. So I appreciate that. And especially where my podcast is overthinking, 
focusing on positive thinking and positive affirmations and not letting too many negative thoughts get in the way, I agree, you're going to attract those negative things if you're thinking negative thoughts. So that's such a beautiful There is thought. that, but the, the other distinction that the elders said was, one of them said was, you can have a negative thought. Of course, that's normal. Yes. You don't have to hold it. <sighs> right? So you can have it there and then just let it go. It's okay. Notice it. You know, for me, I also have another like a metaphor that I use. I think of life as I'm driving down a highway. Probably if it's me, I'm speeding a little bit. I'm driving <laughs> down a highway and I'm, I have a destination in my mind where I'm going. So I have a pretty good idea. And I notice the ditch, right? I notice the ditch. I don't stare at the ditch for too long because what happens when you stare at something? You start veering toward the ditch. Yeah. Right. And you have a rear view mirror. You know, sometimes we spend a lot of time looking back in the past, having regrets about what we did or did not do. You have a rear view mirror. You can glance at it. You just want to make sure no one's like coming up too fast behind you or what have you. You can glance at it to be aware, but you're not staring at that either because that's not the direction you're going. You are going down the highway and you're going to your destination. I do think about that a lot too. That that helps me personally in some situations. Like, am I staring at the ditch right now? Hmm. Right? Am I looking in that rearview mirror for too long? It's those I little that. visuals that I find helpful for myself. It's a great analogy because it's so relatable, right? Driving down the street or driving down the road. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's amazing. Listen, I really appreciate you taking the time, Fiona. Thank you so very much. It's been great. It was a lot of fun to chat with you, Sam, and uh, take care. Thank you so much to my guest, Fiona Kirkpatrick Parsons. I, you know, I feel like I say this often, but this might have been one of my favorite episodes ever to date. So thank you so much, Fiona, for overthinking with me. And I want to send out another thank you to the Mental Health Foundation of Nova Scotia for supporting this season of my podcast. And here's to ending the stigma. Thanks for listening.